Kenny Quay by her granddaughter, Etta S. Wilson. When Kenny Quay's hereditary princess of the Ottawa was about 44 years old, a childless widow, she married Mayan Gun, a young chief half her age, and became the mother of a son. This son, whose English name was Payson Wolf, married Mary Jane Smith, daughter of the Reverend George Nelson Smith and his wife, Arvilla Almira Power Smith, and they became the parents of 13 children. The Smiths were of English, Irish, Welsh descent, were of revolutionary stock, and came to Michigan from Vermont. Kinney Quay was a medicine woman, born on the ancestral acres in Canada. She had been tutored in the arts of simple herb medicines and the sorcery in which her family and her tribe had implicit faith. Her healing powers were wonderful. She was said to be able to cure cancer, scopola, and other dread diseases, and she was believed to be able to bring pestilence and death to any enemy tribe which threatened her own, even when they were at a distance. But with all her so-called powers over life and death, she could not save her own family when an epidemic of smallpox swept over the land. She and her father and brothers survived, but her husband and six children died. Childless, with middle age passing, the chiefs and headsmen of the tribe held the council and agreed that Kinney Quay must marry with the hope of bearing a child. She refused. Then they demanded that she marry. Still she refused. She said that there was not a chief in all the tribe of sufficiency high standing for a Wakazu to marry and be long, and being a daughter of that noble family, she would not wed one unworthy. Conferences among the headsmen and the chiefs continued for some time, while the qualifications of all available chiefs were considered. Finally, her father came to her and said, there was one chief who, standing for bravery and honesty, strength and health were equal to her own. He was Mayan Gun, son of old Mayan Gun, and like his father, bore the name because he had the strength and courage to capture a wolf and strangle it with his bare hands. I cannot marry him, said Kinney Quay. He is but a boy. As a child, he played with my children. Nevertheless, said her father, you must marry him and if possible, raise a son or daughter to whom will descend your powers of healing. Arguments continued for many days, and finally Kinney Quay consented. The two were married in the fall of 1830. The next summer they went southward with the other members of the, the tribe, and in August they stopped to gather berries on Grand Manitoulin Islands, and there was a son born to Kinney Quay. When the child was three days old, the journey southward was resumed. The Wakazu family, of which Kinney Quay was a member, were Ottawas, those people who considered themselves far above the average Indian tribes. Their very name, Ottawa, means trader or merchant. They dealt largely with one of the great fur trading companies of the Northland, being the intermediate between the fur gatherers and the fur buyers. The Wakazus had extensive holdings in the vicinity of Lake Winnipeg, Canada. Tradition or legend passed from parents to children related that the original grant from the Canadian government to this tribe comprised all the area within a square outlined by a day's journey of a horse to the north, another day's trip to the east, and a third day's travel to the south, and a fourth or final day's pace westward to the point of beginning. Within these lines, the tribes lived many years, gradually, however, extending their interests to the south. When a spring thaws came and the water again ran in the ice-locked rivers and cracked creeks, when the winds and the waves of the changing seasons broke up, dispersed and melted the ice on Lake Superior, these Indians left their homes, traveled southward by the waterway, portaging their birch bark canoes from stream to stream, and finally reached the shores of the Great Lake. There they launched their frail crafts laden with their families and their personal possessions, including their food stock, their teepee poles and their rush mats to cover them, their copper and brass kettles and their dogs, chickens and their pigs. The dogs were willing passengers, but the chickens and pigs had to be shackled securely. The return trip in the fall was made in the same manner. The trip, except the long run directly across the lake, was a somewhat leisurely one. 
having safely accomplished the laborious and dangerous journey from the north to the south shore of Lake Superior, the travelers proceeded slowly with frequent stops, fishing, picking berries, and otherwise passing the time pleasantly and profitably. Eventually, in the manner of the true pioneer, the Wakazoo and the Mayan guns with others crossed from the upper to the lower peninsula of Michigan and found life there agreeable and less hazardous. The winters were shorter. There was the same abundance of game and fish, and the soil was fruitful for the corn and simple vegetables which filled their needs. Furs could be sold to the great Astor Company at Fort Mackinac. Moreover, the inhabitants were of their own kind, Ottawas, speaking the same language, and Chippewas with a similar idiom, all with similar manners and habits of living. Settlement was made at La Arbor Croche, which is Cross Village, Middle Village, which was Harbor Springs, and Little Traverse, which is Petoskey. Pagans, as they had been before this migration, now they fell under the tutelage of the Jesuits. At Le Arbor Croche, Pierre Marquette had established a mission, and in this outpost and continuous territory, the teachings of the Catholic Church continued. But dissatisfaction crept in. Many of these savages criticized the doctrines and the conduct of the Church of Rome and remained aloof from the Christian teaching. Then came word of a new religion. Indians passing up and down the coast told of a young and eloquent white preacher, a Reverend George Nelson Smith, who had established a mission at Richland, Kalamazoo County, and was preaching the gospel as interpreted by the Protestant faith. So eager were these red men to have the best that could be attained in religion that they sent missionaries down to interview the new preacher. In the fall of 1837, a company of Indians led by Chief Wakazoo and Chief Shinnecochee went down from Emmett County, met with the Reverend Mr. Smith and others, and an impassioned appeal for the light of religion made by Chief Wakazoo and interpreted by Joseph Prickett government interpreter. So affected Mr. Smith that from that moment he dedicated every effort of his life to the spiritual and temporal welfare of the Indians. He devoted himself to the study of their language and because so proficient that his sermons were soon delivered to them in their own tongue without the assistance of an interpreter. The following year a colony of about 30 Indian families settled in the vicinity of what is now the town of Allegan to form a permanent village under the teachings of the new religion. Among those who joined the little band was old chief Wagazoo and wife, their son Joseph and family, another son Peter with his family, and Kinney Quay, the only daughter with her husband and son. With the exceptions of Kinney Quay, all these individuals embraced Protestantism. Surrounded on every side by converts, she positively refused to accept the new doctrine. The Wakazoos and the Mayan guns were among the most ardent of the new converts, but Kinney Quay remained loyal to Catholicism.